Okay, we're talking on the golden candlestick in the holy place in the tabernacle. I've said that it represented Christ. I said that it represented the Christian. I said that it represented the church and was just finishing up with Revelation chapter 2 where the Lord called the church, referred to the church as the one of the seven candlesticks and said, if you don't repent and do the first works, I will remove the candlestick. And he did remove that testimony. And just archaeologists today go over there and dig in the dirt uh, to see what is left of it. That's a sad picture. But thank God for those that have stood true to the book, right, over the years and true to the Word of God. And then the final thing that in this, under this point, it also is a picture of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. You see, in the golden candlestick, pure olive oil was placed in each of the little cups. And uh, the priest, by the way, the priests were responsible to take care of the golden candlestick, so they had to trim uh, the wicks and so on. They were responsible, seemingly even, for uh, replenishing the olive oil, etc. And oil in Scripture is a type of two things. Oil is a type of joy, and oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. And you know, in Psalm 23, my cup runneth, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And uh, so oil here would be a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. And of course, uh, Jesus said in John 16, 13, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. So the candlestick represents all of that. And that's under discernment. Second point, declaration. In other words, there's a message to be declared. And that message is John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So what's the condition? Here's what he said. He that followeth me. Okay, this is John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have what? the light of life, okay? So the condition there is to follow him. The consequences are not walk in darkness. And then, of course, the conclusion is, but I will walk in the light of life. So the Bible has a lot to say about light. Matter of fact, Paul, writing to the Philippians, talked about shining as lights in this old world. And, uh, you know, the chorus we used to sing a lot in as kids in Sunday school, and it's not just a kid's chorus, but this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan what? No, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. Okay, don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Well, that's a beautiful picture here because the golden candlestick pictures the Lord Jesus, but he also said, we are the light of the world. So, you know, we talk about the world of wickedness and we talk about the darkness of the world, but really, we ought not to blame the unsaved. See, the unsaved are not to blame for the darkness of the world because they don't know any better. They've been blinded by the enemy. They, are with, they do not have a new nature in Christ. And you see, the Bible says that we are the light of the world, so if darkness is prevalent, the light's not shining the way it ought to. And the Bible says we are the salt of the earth. So if corruption is rampant, the salt's not working. So you see, he's placed us in this old world to be salt and light. And we're to be here as a preservative from corruption, but we're also to be here as a light in a dark world. And so the responsibility there is to what? Declare. And in John chapter 1, that scripture that I used from verse 1 right through verse 14, in verse 5, it says that he's unseen. In verse 10, it says he's unknown. And in verse 11, it says he's undesired. Think of that. Unseen, because the natural man cannot see him. Secondly, he's unknown. That's verse 10. Came into his own, verse 10 and 11. Came into his own, and his own received him not. But he was not known of them in verse number 10. And then undesired, not received in verse 11. So that's a picture of the world, right? Without God, without Christ, and without hope. But you and I have been placed in this world 
and we are to be a light in a dark place. And you know, my wife and I have had the joy of traveling around the world, and uh, I was sitting this afternoon doing some meditating, and I tell folks meditate is a Greek word for half asleep. Uh, I was sitting there in my office uh, doing some meditating, and I was in touch by email and correspondence with some of those we support in India, and uh, I was thinking, you know, we've just, uh, it hadn't kind of hit me before, we've just completed 35 years of our ministry in India. Uh, we went to India for the first time uh, 35 years ago, and we began Project India, and uh, I thought of a light shining in a dark world, and I thought this, matter of fact, I sent an email off to someone to say this to him, one of the supporters of Project India. I said, only eternity will reveal, you know, what God has done. You and I, we, we just see a small picture. We see very little of it. But if we let our light shine for the Lord Jesus, okay? And I have two points here. The light of the lampstand was a light of attraction, and it was also a light of adoration. In other words, the light of the six stems all shined and focused on the central staff. How important it is that you and I center our lives and focus on the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So they drew attention to the candlestick. Sometimes we have a tendency to want to draw attention more to ourselves than we do to him. But to be able to just simply appoint people to the Son of God, to the one who is the light of the world, to the one who can shine into the darkened heart of sin with the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then secondly, the light of adoration. In other words, to, to praise him to exalt him, to honor him, to lift him high. And what a joy and privilege. That ought not to ever be a task, right? And then the third point here, direction. The direction. That's Psalm 119, 105. Thy words are lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. The only light in the holy place was the golden candlestick. Okay? There was no light in the holy of holies. But in the, gold, in the holy place, the golden candlestick was the light. So it light shined so they could see at the table of showbread. The light shined so they could see at the altar of incense. But it was the only natural light within the holy place. So you and I have the light of the gospel. We have the light of our Savior. But how important it is that we realize it's all about him, but it's also to give us direction so you can see where you're going, right? In other words, if the path is dark in front of you and everything's all darkness around you, you're kind of feeling your way around, but if you just have a light, any kind of a light, that'll give you some direction, show you where to go, show you what the obstacles are. Well, Jesus Christ is the light of the world. If we would only let him direct us, but that also is beautifully pictured in the pillar of cloud, but particularly in the pillar of fire. Because when they followed that pillar of fire at night, they also had direction in their life. So I just put down three points here. Israel needed a pilot to steer them, they needed a protector to shield them, and they needed a provider to shine on them. Well, Israel wasn't alone. You and I, first of all, we need a pilot to steer us. We need to be led, okay? This is the way, what? Walk ye in it. Man does not naturally travel in right paths. What does the Bible say in Isaiah 53, 6? We've all turned what? Our own way. So we do not naturally, even as believers, we do not naturally follow God's direction and God's leading. So how important it is that we realize we need the light of the glory of God to illuminate for us the way. And you know what? When the Lord lights the path, when the Lord shows the way, and we follow in obedience to him, we can claim victory on that path. Anytime you and I decide to do it our way instead of his way, you know what the result is, right? It's calamity along the way. Then secondly, we need a protector to shield us. We need to be loved. Man 
is so inherent, inherently created that every one of us craves to be loved. I don't care who the person is, if it's the worst criminal in the world. Deep down within, there's a craving to be accepted. There's a craving to be loved. And it's never until a person knows the love of Christ, right? For the love of Christ is what? Shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. And when that love of Christ is shed abroad and he begins to lead us and direct us, he's also a protector and then also a provider to shine on us. I need my pathway lighted. I need to be illumined, my mind, the illuminating and the lighting of the mind to be able to grasp biblical truth. Did you ever read something in the Bible, didn't understand it, then you took a few minutes and talked to the Lord about it and said, Lord, I, I'd just like you to make this portion clear to me. Lord, I don't want to have to go to someone else's book or commentary. I'd just like you to reveal this to me. Show me just what this says. You go back and read it again, and he has just taken that whole thing, and you thought, why didn't I see that before? <laughs> How come I was so slow getting that? What is that? That's the Holy Spirit of God taking the Word of God, because remember Jesus said he will guide you into all truth, right? So he takes us out of the darkness of that passage, illuminates that truth, we begin to see it, and then begin to walk in obedience to him. So, that's the golden candlestick. I'd like to spend more time on it, but by Friday night, I want to get into the Holy of Holies, okay? So now, let's go to the next point, okay? Point number four, in camping with a purpose. Point number one, salvation, a decision for Christ, okay? Point number two, sanctification. That's a dedication to Christ. Point number three, which we've been talking about here tonight, uh, which we've been, you know, meditating on and so on, has to do with the golden candlestick, service, getting involved in the service, direction from Christ. Now we come to number four, the table of showbread. I call this one satisfaction, the declaration of Christ. In John 6.35 in the context of the miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, we have this verse. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Okay? He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth in me shall never thirst. Bread has been referred to as the staple of life. The table of showbread, the basic thought is the table of his presence, okay? It's the face of God being revealed. As you know, Bethlehem, the basic meaning is that place, right? The place of God. So here's the place of the table of showbread. On the table of showbread were placed every Sabbath 12 loaves of bread. One, each one representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And even though the tribes were not all the same size, seemingly from everything you can read in Scripture, the loaves of bread were the same size. And you know, the Bible does not actually state that it was unleavened bread. To my knowledge, if you can find where the Bible does state that it was unleavened bread that was put on the table, uh, show me that Scripture. But Nothing, no leaven was allowed to be put into the bread. So therefore we know it was unleavened bread. No leaven was in it. Leaven, as you know in Scripture, is a type of what? Type of sin, okay? But I cannot find anywhere in Scripture, but if you find it, you show it to me. I'd like to see it. It's probably there. I could not find anywhere where it specifically said that this bread on the table of showbread was unleavened bread, but it had to be because it was part of God's requirement for the bread, for the priesthood, for the nation of Israel. Every Sabbath day, okay, they put 12, put, took 12 loaves off, put 12 loaves on. I have a little section there describing how they did it 
And I want to go to that right now before we really get into the teaching here that's involved in it. So you'll find that little section uh, on your notes down under uh, where it says the changing of bread was an elaborate service. If you find that, okay. And I took this from David Levy's book. And here's what he said, okay. Four priests entered the holy place every Sabbath day, two of them carrying the piles of bread and two of them the cups of incense. Four priests had gone in before them, two to take off the old piles of showbread and two to take off the cups of incense. Those who brought in the new bread stood at the north side facing southward. Those who took away the old bread at the south side facing northward. One part lifted off and the other part put on, the hands of one being over against the hands of the other, as it is written, Thou shalt set upon the table bread of the Passover always before me. The loaves were removed that were removed were delivered to the priests for their consumption within the tabernacle, the whole quantity amounting to about 75 pounds of bread. Why do I take time to read that? Because God had given such minute, such implicit instructions as to exactly how the bread was to be removed. And in other words, there basically was never to be a time when there was not bread on the table. So while one group is taking off, the hands of the other group is putting it on. Now, bread speaks of life. Bread speaks of satisfaction. Bread speaks of sustenance. Bread speaks of fulfillment. And there's a verse I jotted down from an old hymn. It said, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me, till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. That old hymn, what is it? Guide me, O Jehovah. Is that the name of it? I think it is. Okay. Remember the prodigal son? I mean, you might not have been in the far country with him, but you remember reading about him? You remember the prodigal son came to his father and said, Father, I want you to give me my portion that's mine. And the father gave it to him. He took his journey into a far country. The Bible says that he wasted his substance in riotous living. Then the Bible says, when he came to himself, when he finally came to the end of himself, okay, here's what he said to himself. How many hired servants of my father's have what? Bread enough and to spare. And here I am out here, and I would be willing to even eat the leftovers that's given to the pigs, okay? I'd be willing to take the pig food when there's bread enough and to spare in the Father's house. Let's take that by way of illustration tonight. Jesus Christ, the bread of life, satisfies the longing of the soul. As bread is used to satisfy the hunger spiritually, so Jesus Christ, the bread of life, is used to satisfy the hungering soul and the hungering heart spiritually. And you know what? There's bread enough and to spare tonight in the Father's house. But how many professing believers try to find their satisfaction somewhere else? They try to find their fulfillment somewhere else. Then there's one other aspect of the table that I think is so important. Because I think the table of showbread, which is the table of the face, which is the table of his presence. So I believe the table of showbread really speaks of fellowship. And I believe as the priests actually fellowship around the table, there was a ministry involved in it. I believe one of the greatest privileges that you and I have as the people of God is Christian fellowship. And Christian fellowship is something you don't seem to really appreciate it 
until you do not have it. My wife and I on occasion have been with missionaries in remote parts of the world. And we felt when we left, we had far more ministry probably to that missionary family or those missionary families than we probably actually had to the national people. Even though we were there mostly to minister to the national people. You know why? Because they removed. I mean, they, they don't have a Christian brother or sister they can just call up and say, you know, let's go have a cup of coffee. They don't have a Christian brother or sister that they can say, let's just get together for an hour, you know, just a fellowship in the chat. And sometimes as God's people, we fail to really appreciate all that we have in Christian fellowship. And I get real concerned about that when I see a generation that wants to give the Lord an hour on Sunday morning and then not really be bothered too much the rest of the week. Now, I'm getting rid of a little spiritual indigestion, so you stay with me, and I'm giving it to the wrong crowd because you're here. <laughs> but no, I mean, there was a day, folks, when we would have revival evangelistic meetings. We'd go for eight days. We'd go for 10 days. We'd go for two weeks. Sometime, Billy Sunday, way back in his day, I know in Scranton, Pennsylvania, they went for six weeks. Uh, I mean, as long as God was blessing, they would just keep going. And then I remember when, I, when we first started out, we had just finished 43 years of being on the road, and uh, we'd have a lot of meetings Sunday to Sunday. We'd have some 10-day meetings. I had a few two weeks, not a lot, but about every meeting I had was Sunday to Friday, just about every meeting. That's long gone. And then a few are left Sunday to Wednesday. Some will do Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Some will do a Saturday and a Sunday. Some want Sunday morning only. And I remember our first tent meeting that we had in, in Newport. And uh, I sent out a letter to, I don't know, about 50 churches, I think, in the greater, this greater central Maine area. Anyone that I knew that loved the Lord and preached the gospel and uh, invited them to a free meal because you invite a preacher to a free meal, they'll drive for miles. And uh, so we, we had a good time, pastors and wives. And then after, and I told him in the letter, basically what I wanted to do. So after the meal, I said, basically, I met with the men and I said, men, basically, it's like the song says, I didn't come to ask you for anything. I just came to like to share with you what I'd like to do. So I shared with them, this was about a year and a half in advance. I'd like to do an old-fashioned tent meeting. I'm going to do it in Newport. And I'd like to go eight days, Sunday to Sunday. We'll have the Sunday service at 2.30 in the afternoon. That won't interfere with the schedule of a local church. And uh, then on Saturday, we'll have the meeting at 12 o'clock noon. And then we'll have an old-fashioned like a Sunday school church picnic, you know, we'll have a chicken barbecue and we'll have a field day and uh, the whole bit. I also said we'll have two tents. See, the whole world lives in two tents, content and discontent. And uh, I said we'll have two tents. We'll have one for the teenagers and the adults. We'll have one for the boys and girls. I'll bring in somebody to share with the boys and girls. I'll bring in a special musical group, either a family or soloist or whatever. We'll have a crusade choir, Brother Ed Jaworski, that many of you knew, pastored for many years in Corinna. He led our choir and led our singing. And uh, we'll just have... Uh, you know, an old-fashioned tent meeting for eight days. And uh, so I opened up for questions. One of the very first questions was, don't you think eight days is too long? I said, you're probably right, but we're never going to know until we try it. So we're going to try eight days. Do you think people will come to a tent in Maine in the summertime with all the mosquitoes? Well, if you're going to have a meeting in a tent in Maine, you better have it in the summertime, right? And uh, then how are you going to pay for it? Well, we said, we believe if it's of the Lord, God's people will meet the need. Then, of course, the question you always get, what are you going to do with the converts? You know, 
I always get concerned about people wanting to know what you're going to do with the converts when you don't have any. <laughs> Let's get some people saved, and if they're from your area and you preach the gospel, you receive information on it, okay? Well, anyway, I'm happy to tell you we had it. Many of you know you attended. We had it. We averaged right at 400 people per meeting for eight days, which I thought in central Maine was unbelievable. We had 79 people that were personally counseled one-on-one, -on -one, trusted Christ as Savior. God met the needs financially. Everything was just great. And uh, it was it looked like the Beverly Hillbillies when we got it all set up. And uh, But you know what was one of the greatest things that came out of that tent meeting? And then we did, what, two others, I think, after that. One of the greatest things came out of it, and people still say to me today, the fellowship. The Christians, churches came together, and people were there early, you know, each night and so on. Christian fellowship. And I find that today it's lacking. Not always, but it's lacking. And sometimes you've got to work at it, right? But I believe the table of showbread is a beautiful picture of just Christian fellowship. As the priests ministered around the table, at the table, as they ministered in the holy place at the golden candlestick and at the, especially at the altar of incense, the place of prayer. But now here, satisfaction, the declaration of Christ. In other words, we see the Lord Jesus presented. And by the way, he's always the focus of fellowship. So what is fellowship? Well, I like the way one man put it. He said fellowship is just two fellows in the same ship getting along with each other. But if you want the technical definition, fellowship is a joint participation in a common cause. That's the technical definition. Fellowship is a joint participation in a common cause. Actually, ours is not a common cause. Ours is a common person. And he's not really common, right? He's unique. But see, Christian fellowship centers in Jesus Christ. You can't have fellowship between unsaved and saved. No, you can have friendship, which you ought to, okay? You've got to win a friend often before you win a soul. But real fellowship has to have a bond in Christ. And so what we see here is a picture of that. And so the bread basically represented the presence of Almighty God. And one of the greatest blessings that you and I have in our Christian life and our walk with the Lord is to enjoy the presence of Almighty God, that He is ever present. And you've all heard me do my little thing on He's before me and behind me and above me and below me and all around me. And that's not just a little thing that I run by. You know why? Because that's real. That's real. See, in Genesis 17, 1, God said to Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. So if Abraham's walking before God, God's behind him, backing him up. Deuteronomy 13, 4 says, thou shalt walk after the Lord your God. So if I'm walking after God, he's in front of me to lead me, to direct me, right? Deuteronomy 33, 24, I believe it is, says, underneath are the everlasting arms. He's below me. Psalm 91.1 says, I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So he's above me. Genesis 5.24 says, Enoch walked with God. Genesis 6.9, Noah walked with God. The Bible says in Psalm 16.8 and Job 23.9, he's on my right hand and he's on my left hand. So what have I got? I got him before me to guide me, behind me to back me up, below to support, above to protect, and either side to fellowship. But then if you're saved, Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Galatians 2.20, Christ liveth in me. So where is he? He's in me. Then Psalm 34.7 says, the angel of the Lord encampeth where? Round about them that fear him. So he's all around me. So that's the presence of Almighty God. And one of the wonderful things of the entire ministry of the tabernacle, it was where God met with his people and his people met with him. And it was a place of fellowship and the central theme was the person and the presence of Almighty God in the person of the pre-incarnate Son of God, the Lord Jesus. So what a beautiful picture we have here, okay? And the bread had to be continual upon the table. Then they also, 
put frankincense, to give it, sort of to give it a fragrance, okay? It was put in the bread for a remor- memorial. And one of the main things with relation to the bread was this. It was a time of remembrance. So if you think of the bread as a time of remembrance, give me an event in the local church that we practice today that would be pictured here. What is it? The Lord's Supper, communion service. That ought to be one of the most special times. My, that's one of the things my wife and I miss in our ministry of traveling because most of the time we miss when they have it in a local church. And once in a while we do hit it when they do. But the Bible says, as you know in Corinthians, that when we come together, okay, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to his soul. But you remember this bread is his body that was broken for me. This cup speaks of his blood that was shed. Go back to the brazen altar. There's the cup. There's the blood. Come to the table of showbread. Here's the bread. Here's the broken body of the Son of God. Also back at the cross, of course, was the broken body. But here is the presence of Almighty God. And this uh, table of showbread was to be made out of acacia wood or shittim wood. It was to be overlaid with gold. Everything you saw in the holy place was gold. The size of it, three and a half feet long, so not that big. What are we talking? Three and a half feet. Am I roughly about three and a half feet there, you carpenters that are out there? That'd be fairly close, brother. Not really. <laughs> okay. okay, but roughly, okay. Then I know this here is roughly six. So about three and a half feet. Then it's only one and a half feet wide. And then it's 27 inches high. So it's not that, you know, not that large a table. But that's the plan. The position Where was it? Right across from the golden candlestick, just inside the entrance as you went in to minister unto the Lord. Now, the purpose. What's the purpose of a table of showbread? I have it down. Point number one, the presence of the Lord. Point number two, the provision of the Lord. Point number three, the provisions of the Lord. And then, point number four, participation with the Lord. We may not get all that in, but we'll get in some of it, okay? First, the presence of the Lord. It was called the bread of the presence. I like to call it practicing his presence. That is one of the keys to victorious Christian living. If you and I would live every moment, and I'm talking to myself as well as I am to you, but if you and I would live every moment of our lives conscious that God is present. What a conviction. What a conviction. What a comfort. What a comfort. He's present. Where I go, he goes, he's there. That's a great comfort, but that's also a great conviction. You know why? What I say, he's listening. The way I act, he's watching. What I do, he's observing. He's ever present. But if we would live every moment practicing his presence, thou, God, seest me. And one of the most wonderful things about the holy place and the holy of holies, because the holy of holies was the Shekinah glory, that was the ultimate presence of Almighty God. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, right? So at the brazen altar, we saw the grace of God. At the brazen altar, we saw the mercy of God. At the brazen altar, we saw the love of God. At the brazen altar, we saw the compassion of the Son of God. So now, as we proceed in sanctification, as we proceed in service, Now, as we proceed in finding our fulfillment and our ultimate satisfaction in him. There's a song that says, I tried the broken cisterns of this old world. They do not satisfy. Then the theme song, 
of our Living Waters Camp, written by John Peterson, one of the great hymn writers and songwriters that ever lived, drinking at the springs of living water. John chapter 7. Remember what Jesus said? Out of his belly shall flow what? Rivers of living water. So when we think of the table of showbread, remember this. There's bread enough and to spare in the Father's house. So what that really says is you and I can find our absolute fulfillment all that we need, we can find it in him. And he's ever present. So that's his presence. Now, in case you didn't get those verses that I gave you on the presence of God, if you want to see me afterwards, I'll be happy to give them to you. They're not there on your notes. Number two, the provision of the Lord. The Lord's table, when we meet together at the Lord's table, it's a time of remembrance. There's one book in the Old Testament above all others that would be called the Book of Remembrance. Can somebody tell me what that book is? One Bible book in the Old Testament, over and over, it says, lest thou forget, remember, remember. Nobody want to venture a guess? you got two choices. You're either right or wrong. Okay? I'll help you. It's the Book of Deuteronomy. Book, geez, some of you knew you just didn't want to say, right? Okay, the book of Deuteronomy. Matter of fact, Deuteronomy 2 7, listen to this verse. For the Lord thy God hath blessed you in all the works of your hands. He knows you're walking through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord thy God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. That's Deuteronomy 2 7. That's God's reminder to the nation of Israel of how good he had been to them. And God says, for 40 years, Paul the Apostle quotes part of that over in his sermon in the New Testament in Acts 13, and one of the new translations puts it this way in Paul's sermon. For 40 years, God put up with their foolishness in the wilderness. I like that translation, okay? For 40 years, God put up with their foolishness in the wilderness. I'd have given up on that crowd two weeks out of Egypt. I'd have said, fooey on you, you're not worth it. But you know what? I'd have given up on me a long time ago too. Don't smile, I'd probably have given up on you. No, aren't you glad God doesn't give up on us? Aren't you glad? So when we come to the Lord's table, what is it? This do in remembrance. But notice, it's got a time period on it. Till he come. Till he come. You see... When the real person is there, you don't have to read their love letters. Put the letter aside and enjoy their presence. One of these days, we're going to step from the scene of time, just the picture, just the type, just the shadow, and we're going to step into the Holy of Holies. We're going to step into the Shekinah glory. And I'm convinced, one second, in the presence of Almighty God, the things of this old world aren't going to amount to much. The song says, if I turn my eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, that the things of earth will grow what? Strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. So when I think of the table of showbread, I think of God's presence, but I also think of God's provision. Now, how did God provide for Israel as far as food was concerned? Every day, except on the Sabbath day, he gave them a double dose the day before. But every day during their entire wandering in the wilderness. You, you just, that, your mind can't comprehend that. Neither can mine. And you, I don't know what manna was like. I don't know. What's the word manna mean, Anybody? What is it? That's what it means. Do you ever sit down at the table and say, what is it? <laughs> you better not if your wife prepared it. Okay? So, so manna, the word manna basically means, what is it? I don't know what type of stuff it is. But you know what? It must have been pretty good stuff. It's satisfied. And keep in mind, how many is God feeding? A couple of million. That's, that's the least. It could be two and a half million. So you imagine, 
every day he sent enough manna from heaven for the entire wilderness journey. Is it any wonder God said in that verse I gave you in Deuteronomy uh, 2.7, For the Lord thy God hath blessed you in all the works of your hands. He knows you're walking through this great wilderness. These 40 years, you have lacked what? Nothing. Now, you're not wandering in the wilderness. For some of us, it may have been a little longer than 40 years. And others of us, it might have been a little less, right? But thank some of you young people tonight saying, 40 years, that's a long time. Well, when you get there, you'll look back and say, where'd he go? Then you remember Elijah down by the brook. I talked about him here on Sunday. What did God do? He sent the birds every morning. Caw, caw, caw. And he met his every need for one entire year. And you and I think we can't trust him. So thank God, not only for his presence, thank God for his provision, meeting my every need. In the whole context of John 6, I'll give you a little assignment. We only got a couple of minutes left. I'll give you a little assignment. No, you can do this on your own. Read the entire sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. That's where he said, I'm the bread of life in verse 35. And as you get further along, every time you come to the word bread in that chapter, just notice it. If you're in the habit of marking your Bible, even mark it. Because that chapter is saturated with it. Okay? Bread, bread, bread. And he's talking about meeting their every need. So, I would say at the table of showbread, we have food and we have fellowship. Those two words describe every Baptist. You can't fellowship without food, right? I noticed we were all doing a pretty good job down there. No. So here's the table of showbread. The third point here, and I'm not going to deal with it because we don't have time tonight, but I will tomorrow, right? His promises. The promises of God. His promise to Israel. His promise to the church. His promise to the individual Christian. And his promise to the world in general if they'll just listen to what he has to say. Camping with God. The golden candlestick, the light of the world, is Jesus. The whole world lies in darkness. Let you and let me be a reflector of the light of the glory of God. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Thank you for this time together tonight. Dismiss us with your blessing. Give safety to our various homes and help us to be a shining light in a dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks.